as we've seen, John begins his uh, gospel, uh, which he uh, writes um, 30, 30 years, give or take 10 um, or so with the, from the other gospels later than them. Uh, but he writes explaining who Jesus is and Jesus' origin, he explains here at the front of his gospel. So we read of that from John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. This is God's word, eternally true. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. Now, please turn back to chapter 8, and we'll read verse 12. John 8, chapter 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness but we'll have the light of life. Here ends our reading. Let's uh, pray to the Lord. By the way, the word of the Lord. Amen. There we go. Um, when, I, when Betsy and I were, I think, in our first year of campus ministry at Indiana University, our um, campus director's wife, um, her family was from the Warsaw, Indiana area, Warsaw, Winona Lake um, there, and they had a, a house up there that was kind of like a cabin right on the lake. And so we would, at the beginning of each uh, year, go up for like a, a staff retreat. There was a staff of like 12 to 14 people, depending on the year. We were there for four years. And, and uh, I, I remember um, we decided after we had gotten out of the, the, the lake there um, to play touch football. Um, but it was it was guys and, and we hadn't put our shoes on yet. And so we were playing and... And uh, my campus director, who was, I don't know, 6'1 or something like that. I'm 5'9". Um, there was a, a perfectly positioned pass that went to him. And I jumped up to, to, to get the pass, but it went just beyond my fingers. And it went into his hands. So I, I landed back down and I turned around and started running fast after him to catch him. And the back of his heel hit my middle uh, toe. And I was in intense pain. It, it broke. It was broken. First time I ever broke a bone after all my sports and all that kind of thing. Um, and, and so it was tremendously, tremendously painful. Uh, we had uh, Larissa at the time. And uh, she in the cabin, um, maybe a couple hours later, or maybe it was the next day, I forget, uh, was having her nap time. And so we went up in the room that they had very nicely given to us. They gave us a whole room since we were one of two... Uh, staff couples with a, a kid and, and I needed to get something in the room. I forget what it was. Uh, but as I'm in there in the room, kind of hobbling, um, to get whatever it was, the room was completely dark and I stubbed my broken toe on something. <laughs> Little did I know there, I had an audience because we had a baby monitor up there in the room. Fortunately, I didn't say any bad words, and they told me when I came back down that they were impressed, so. <laughs> but when it's dark, it's, it's hard to know the way, and, and we stumble uh, when it's dark. And if you like to fill out blanks in an outline, there, there you go, in your introduction there. Those in a dark room stumble. Those in a dark room stumble. Um... And we're not talking here as we look at what Jesus says here. We're not talking about a humorous stumble like me, you know, on my back grabbing my foot and something funny like that happened. But, but something that's really a, a tragedy stumbling. Um, 
you know, we have friends or maybe we've experienced things ourselves in our lives that are, are, are tragedies that are based on not understanding a situation that was before us or, or a friend or a loved one of ours not understanding life and how it works and how they should have responded. And so we, we, we know people and, and the earth is full of people and the movie industry exists with stories of people who have committed errors in life that affect them for the rest of their lives in, in really difficult ways. Um, and Jesus talks about that, that here, that darkness that we can have and, and that uh, most people in life have as they approach life. They approach life not, I mean, the, the sun shines out and there are lights in the ceiling, but, but in terms of understanding life and being able to see what's before them, to see what do I need to do? How do I need to respond? Do I hold my tongue here? Do I speak up? Uh, do I take this direction or that direction? That there's just darkness there and a lot of guessing. Um, now, you know, if you're older like me, maybe you're benefiting. You know, I, I grew up with unbelieving parents, but, but, my, um, but my father had grown up with devoted to Jesus parents. You know, my grandfather did prison ministry and all this, and it just took my dad till he was 25 to come to faith in Jesus. I was a sophomore in high school. Uh, but because of this, even though he wasn't a believer, he was walking in his father's ways and in his mother's way. And there were certain things that he would never do and certain things he did and that he would teach me to do. And so even though he was walking in darkness and I was walking in darkness, it provided some kind of residual light for us. But in society, that's less and less now. That somebody's grown up with, with parents or even grandparents who are devoted followers of Jesus. And so we talk about that this morning, the benefit of Jesus to you and me for our lives and how, how we live, how we live our lives. Um, number one there, three things as we look at this single verse, really, uh, just verse 12. Um, verse 13, he starts into a whole new subject, which we'll, we'll, we'll look at next week. Uh, but ver verse 12, um, Jesus teaches three things. One, he teaches that he's God. Jesus teaches here that he's God. Now, John does this. All scripture does this. Um, but Jesus teaches here, teaches here he is God. Now, if you've been uh, around either theological liberalism, which is what I grew up in, or you've been um, uh, in a religion class at a university, which I've been in, uh, or you've just been out in society, you know that that's one of the chief attacks uh, of um, Christianity, that it's claimed that Jesus is not God. I remember being in a, a religion class called Portraits of Jesus my freshman year in college, and uh, Dr. Herbert Wolf, um, who was a theologically liberal um, uh, religion professor, uh, teaching us, trying to teach us, that the Bible nowhere said that Jesus was God, and that Jesus never made this claim for himself. And uh, I've told you this before if you were here maybe a couple of times you've heard this from me before he passed out i don't know if they they just still don't have them they do everything online with computers but before he passed out the blue books anyone remember blue books they're little yeah little paper booklets that you would take an exam in um, and before he passed those out along with the final exam for the the final of portraits of jesus he says okay here's the final you've got an hour to take it um, you can just set it on my desk when you're at, at the front here when you're done. Um, he said, I, I hope if there's a one thing that you've gotten out of this class, it's this, that Jesus is a man and no more. And, and those were the last words he said to us. Um, and so certainly that's a, a claim of things. And he had tried to show through the Gospel of Mark that Jesus never uh, uh, claimed that he was God. That's not true in the Gospel of Mark. It's not true in any of the Gospels. You know, it's just one of those things that gets in your head. And then when you read the Bible for the rest of your life, you're like, this proves, this is saying Jesus is God. Here's Jesus saying he's God. Here's Jesus saying he's God. Um, and so it, it, it's clearly in there. But this is something that um, all the Gospel writers, um, as I read the four Gospels, they're all making this point. Now, all gospel writers have different emphases, um, but one emphasis, that, one emphasis they all have is they are showing that Jesus is God. Jesus is saying only things God can say, 
He's doing things only God can do. He's accepting worship from other people and still claiming to be a good Jew. You can't do that unless you're God. You can't take worship to yourself and claim to be a good Jew unless you're God. Then you can take worship to yourself. Um, but Jesus taught that he is God and he teaches it here. Uh, and here in this verse, here's how he teaches it. He says, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. Now that's a claim to divinity. Um, and here's how, that's your A point there. Jesus said I, that he is the light of the world. Um, we can read in 1 John 1, 5 uh, that, she, that God is light. Um, uh, God says that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Scripture says God is light. And Jesus says, I am the light. So this is a claim based on Jesus, based on Scripture that, that God, that Jesus himself is God. Uh, also in Scripture, see, light is credited to God throughout Scripture. Light is credited to God in Scripture. So from, you know, if you read the first part of John, you see that John is picking up on the language of Genesis in the beginning. And in Genesis, is God created the heavens and the earth. But, but, but we know here that the first thing that God creates, and John tells us in John 1, that Jesus is the person of the Trinity who is creating. Nothing that has been created was created but by Jesus. So the Father commanded the creation, but Jesus creates. Okay, so those are the roles of the Trinity there. But we know from Genesis that the first thing that God creates is light. Let there be light, and there was light. Um, so light is credited to God in Scripture. We see that in Genesis 1, 1 through 3. Um, Psalm 36, 9, uh, the writer of the psalm there says that, that uh, God, you've given us your light. Um, Revelation 22, 5, the reason there's no need for a sun in the new heavens and new earth is because Jesus is there and he is the light. Uh, and so this claim to be light is a claim to be God uh, himself. And, and the Jews that Jesus was surrounded with knew this particularly because they knew their, they knew their Old Testaments. It was God who had created light. It was God who is light. John uh, had emphasized this when he wrote earlier. We believe that he wrote First John earlier than the Gospel of John uh, when, when he says there that uh, uh, God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Um, so Jesus teaches that he's God. Um, so we, we know that, and that's a central thing uh, that we have in, in Christianity. Jesus is God. And uh, we were talking uh, yesterday one of the chief things among Christian cults, that's the first thing to go, and that's the first thing you can recognize as to whether a some kind of sect, religious sect, is a cult or not. You ask them, do you believe Jesus is God, eternally existing God, uncreated? And Christian cults say, no, he's not God. Or they, they might say, he became God, or he wasn't God at the beginning. Um, but became God at some point. Uh, but, but, but most just don't, don't take Jesus' divinity at all. And so we want to be very clear as, as uh, God's people that Jesus is God. Now, second thing that this passage teaches here, um, Jesus taught that he is the creator and the giver of life. Jesus is the creator and the giver of life. Again, we get this out of, out of verse 12. Um, but 2a there, in the Gospel of John, um, light uh, sometimes refers to physical life. Uh, we've talked about before, John, one of the things he does in his Gospel is he uses an image and it has two meanings all at once. He does that with all, all these things. So, you know, I'm the bread of life. It's, it's two meanings. I'm the light of the world. Two, two meanings. Even Caiaphas will say later in the gospel, you know, don't you know that it's wise for us that one man die for the nation, then the whole nation perish? He means it one way. John records it, knowing that his readers will understand it in its true meaning. And, and he makes a note there and says, Caiaphas basically didn't understand what he was saying, but he said this because God directed it. This was true. Jesus would die 
for his holy people, for his nation. Um, and so this is the, tr this is the case with uh, the word light as well. Uh, light sometimes refers to physical life. Life sometimes refers to physical life. And that's probably the preeminent meaning there in John chapter 1. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. Um, that, and, it, and John has just finished saying there that Jesus created everything that's been created and that Jesus is the life giver. And then he, he concludes there in that last verse we read, and Jesus, though he created the world, came to the world, but the world that he created didn't recognize him. So Jesus gave light or life, physical life, to every person. And every person who saw him when he was on the earth, he had given them life. And they still had life because he was sustaining their life. Um, but they didn't recognize him. And so that's the, that's the case there. So verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 4, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. Um, Psalm 56, 13 uh, says, For you have delivered me from death and my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. Okay, so it's a kind of a frequent expression in Scripture that uh, to walk in the light is to have life itself. Second thing, B, light also speaks in the Gospel of John of spiritual life, of spiritual life. Um, this is spoken of uh, in other places as well as the Gospel of John. Um, John often means uh, both things, uh, physical life and spiritual life, sometimes emphasizing one, sometimes the other. Uh, but Ephesians 5, 8, um, Paul writes, For you were once darkness that is spiritually dead. You were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Now you're alive. You have spiritual life in the Lord. And then he says, live as children of light. Live as those who have spiritual life spiritual power, spiritual ability to do the things that God commands us to do. Ephesians 5, 13, a little bit further down, Paul says, speaking of spiritual birth, the spiritual birth of Christians, um, Paul speaks of this spiritual life as light shining on the person. Um, he says, wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, that is, rise from your spiritual death, and Christ will shine on you. So Paul speaks of the process of spiritual birth as going from darkness to light, because Jesus, the light of the world, has shone on you. Third thing, C. Jesus, as God, possesses both. Jesus is the possessor of God. We're just, as human beings, uh, recipients of life. We didn't start our life. We don't finish our life. God takes it. He gives it. Um, so Jesus, as God, possesses both kinds of life itself and gives spiritual life to some. So Jesus is the, the, uh, the, the giver of the light. You know, the giver, he gives light to men. Uh, so he gives spirit, physical life to all who are alive, all who are born living are given life by Jesus, physical life. But to some, Jesus gives spiritual life as well, or spiritual light as well. To some, Jesus shines on them, and they wake from their sleep, which is an ancient way of speaking of death. Like we say, oh, he's passed on, right? We mean he died. Uh, but, but ancient people in the Bible speaks of, of death as, as sleep. Um, and so wake from your, wake from your sleep because Christ, uh, when Christ shines on you, um, Jesus says this in John five twenty one. um, he says, just as the father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the son gives life to whomever he is pleased to give it. So Jesus establishes that I'm the giver of life. I'm the giver of life, and I give that life to whomever I am pleased to give it. My choice. If I'm pleased to give it to this person and not to that person. That's what I do.
And, and he's speaking of this, not a physical life. He's speaking to living people, physically living people. But he's explaining there, uh, as he does in a, a few verses, that there are some who hear the voice of the Son of God and some who don't. And that's all based on whether they have spiritual life or not. They have spiritual life, they have spiritual ears, and they hear. So Jesus says a time is, is coming and now is. When the dead, spiritually dead, will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. Um, so Jesus is this giver um, of life. He says a little bit later in John 5, 26, as the Father is life in himself, so is, he has granted the Son to have life in himself. And so when Jesus makes this claim, I'm the light of the world, he's saying I'm the one who has life and who gives life life. Now, third thing, third thing. So we've talked about how Jesus is God himself. Jesus is the creator and the giver of life. That's what the creator does. But Jesus also taught that he gives understanding. And that's the big point. And that's where he really focuses this statement at this point. Uh, he talks about being the light of the world in chapter 9 as well. But right now, in verse 12, he really focuses the idea of his being the light of the world in this direction, that he's the giver of understanding. Um, that is the light to see and understand life. And he gives this understanding to his followers. That's your blank there. So that's all from verse 12. He says, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, so whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. Those who don't follow me, they're walking in darkness. But whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Uh, so again, my stubbing my toe, you know, getting whatever uh, in, Larissa's nap, in Larissa's nap room. Um, I didn't have light. Uh, so I didn't understand that there was something there where I was about to put my broken toe. Um, so I put it there because I didn't have that understanding. Now, uh, uh, some things for us to understand this. What is this understanding? How do we get it? How does Jesus give a person understanding of life? How does he do that? How does he accomplish that so that we can be people who walk around with understanding life, understanding relationships, understanding people, understanding how to uh, respond when offended, how to encourage, how to, well, how do we respond? How do we, how do we live? Um, A, Jesus gives light not by two things. There are two things he doesn't do to give light. Um, one, um, not by, not by spiritual antennae, okay? Um, not by spirit. So you, so you don't sit around and, and cross your legs and do something like this with your hands and say, om, om, uh, or, or put up antennae on your, on your head and say, speak to me, God. Um, God is not speaking to us directly now. And that's what Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2 is about. Uh, the writer of Hebrews says um, that in the Old Testament, God spoke directly, not to everybody, but to some. To prophets, priests, and kings, who would then convey that message to the rest of God's people. Thus saith the Lord. But not everybody was receiving a direct message from God. But now the writer of Hebrews says, nobody's receiving a message like the prophets, priests, and kings today anymore. He says in former times, that was the case where there was direct communication in, in, uh, through various men in various ways, he said. But now he has spoken to us uh, in his son. Um, so not by spiritual antennae, uh, so don't expect, uh, don't pray and expect for the voice of God to speak in your head and in your thoughts. Uh, and, unless what you think of is something from Scripture, which God wrote. Uh, but more on that in just a little bit. Number two, another way that Jesus doesn't give you light or doesn't give you understanding today, not by your looking within. Okay, so you've all heard this. So that's why I'm mentioning this now. 
As you've all heard, people think, you know, talk as if God's talking directly to them, giving them direct answers for their particular questions for them living in Waldo, Ohio in 2024. Um, should I get the cheese fries or the, the, the fried mushrooms or the bologna sandwich? Um, you know, like God would give them a drink. God doesn't speak that way. Uh, but God also doesn't speak by looking within. And you hear a lot of that now. And that's used to be just in kind of Eastern mysticism. Looking within, you know, let your, or Jiminy Cricket. Let your conscience be your guide is a little bit of that, right? Um, but not looking within because Here's what scripture says about our, our looking within. Our in, our inwardness is where our sin nature is. And when we look inward, we're looking toward our own sinfulness, which is polluting our thoughts, polluting our decision that we're trying to make now. And so Galatians 5, 16, 17 says all these awful things that come out of our sin nature. Or if we're not convinced by Paul in Galatians 5, 16 and 17, here's what Jesus says about our inside in Matthew 15, 19 and 20. He says, for out of the heart come nice thoughts and butterflies <laughs> and purity. No, Jesus says, for out of the heart come evil thoughts murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what make a man unclean. So we don't want to look within. We, when we look within, we want to distrust that. If we have a thought from within, we, we want to say, ooh, man, that, well, I, I, don't, I do the opposite of giving it the benefit of the doubt. This may be a good thought, but I need to check it by something external to me because I have a sin nature which wants to get things for myself and doesn't care about the consequences that provides for other people when I get what I want. So instead, B. Uh, we, see, we see in Scripture that Jesus gives light or understanding by these. That's your word there. These two things instead. Um, how does scripture instruct us to get understanding in life? Two things that are the main things that we think about. And so when we're looking for understanding in life, two things we want to think about. And the first thing that scripture itself tells us that we get wisdom in life from is A, the Bible. Is that A? No, one, the Bible. The Bible gives us wisdom and understanding in life. And so we read this with Jim back and forth as we've prepared to, to read the rest of scripture um, from Psalm 119, wonderful Psalm, longest chapter in the Bible, if you can call it a chapter, uh, to the Psalm 119. Um, even in a, a, a one-year Bible reading plan, it's divided up into two days. Um, so that's a lot of material there. Uh, but listen to some of these things. Verse 98 of, of Psalm 118. Your commands make me wiser than my enemies. What makes him wiser than his enemies? His spiritual antennae? God speaking directly into his head? What makes him wiser than his enemies? Looking within? No. Listen again. Your commands make me wiser than my enemies. And, and that's especially potent for us today in 2024 in the United States of America because the evangelical church, those who believe the Bible, have said the commands of God are what you want to avoid because that's legalism, right? And, and so people get nervous. You know, you folks not so much because you've been here for a while uh, and you understand what the Bible understands. Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it day and night. That's the perspective of Scripture about the law. That's not saying, oh, how I love the gospel, how I meditate on it day and night. Now, the gospel is great, but that's not what it says. It doesn't say, oh, how I love your grace and despise the rest. No, it's, oh, how I love your law. Why? Because the law is teeth. It tells me what to do in life. It tells me to honor my parents, and there's blessing in that. It tells me not to lust after another woman in my life. It tells me one wife. And be faithful to her. I love the law because it tells me that. Because if I look within, that's not what I'm doing. Um, 
but there's great blessing to being faithful, you know, in marriage. There's great blessing to being patient and forgiving with the people around us. We get blessed because we're patient. Later, the people we've been patient with realize what a jerk they've been and they come back to us and they realize what a treasure we are. And then we get benefits from that because we, we follow the commands of God. Be patient, God says to us. And we follow that and we experience blessing from being patient to other people. And so then we come back to God and say, oh, how I love your law. It makes me wiser than my enemies. My enemies are dealing with their, their transgressors, those who have transgressed them, with vengeance. Tit for tat. And they wind up in war, like in you know, Ireland, in the Middle East. You know, it just never stops, right? Because no one just stops and forgives and says, truce and I forgive you. Um, so your commands make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more, listen to this, I have more insight than all my teachers. When I was in college, I was an English major, and one of the, the blessings, again, oh, how I love your law, makes me wiser than my teachers. I found out in my senior competency exams that my professors enjoyed reading my papers more than my classmates. You know what my papers were about? Because they were English majors. They let, me, they, let me, they let you write on anything you wanted to about this book or that book or this poem. They would define the poem or the book or whatever, but they'd say any topic. And all my classmates would go to commentaries on this book or you know different things that had been written about it, and I would go to the Bible. And I would talk about a biblical theme that's present in this novel or present in this poem. And, and they loved reading my papers because they weren't hearing this from any place else. And, and, and I heard from a, 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 an English major who was a, a year ahead of me in school. He said, I always like when you raise your hand in class because it's like we're all f f floating around and what this poem meant. You raise your hand and it settles the discussion. Everyone's like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. But it was because I understood life from the scriptures. And so I understood the pain. I understood the victory. I understood that stuff that was going on. And this wasn't my wisdom because I was a kid who was, as a non-believer and as a young believer, didn't understand poetry. You know, I was, I was with you. I know, I realize 85% of you are like, poems can mean anything. Who knows? Whoa. Like that. They mean that the, the poet meant something. He was writing about something. But I got to understand that from the scriptures. And I realized, so there I am in front of my professors and my senior competency exams. And I'm realizing I have more insight than all my teachers because they're not believers. And they're reading things that say, man, that makes sense. Um, and and that's, that's what we have in, in life, that we have more insight than the people who are our authorities. And we still treat our authorities with, with honor and respect, and we submit to their authority as long as they are not acting us to disobey our God. Um, but, but we have more insight than they do. Uh, and that's a wonderful thing. You know, I just, uh, one of the things I love about Christianity is, is that we, we read the Bible and, and we'll get to the next topic here. I'll, I'll, I'll veil that now. We'll read the Bible and this other thing that I'm about to talk about and we understand life. To, to me, that has no end of enjoyment. To do something right. To get something, to do something in such a way that it's like, wow, man, that worked. Um, but, but we get that with life. You know, you know, my story about my dad teaching me one Saturday at the Ohio Wesleyan University gym, this certain move where you go under the basket and you're, since you're five, nine, he was five, eight, uh, I was, I'm five, nine. You, you go, you go under the basket and you realize all the big guys are there. And if I take a layup, I'm going to get stuffed. So he said, John, keep your dribble. You come out around. Here's the basket. You come out around here. And he said, right when you get here, you know, about at that lower block, there's a big rectangular block that separates like the the guy who stands first and the guy who stands second during a foul shot. Right when you get around that block, no one will be guarding you. And my dad played basketball and he was good. He made the, he walked on at Ohio State and played his freshman year. But uh, at 5'8", how about that? Um, but uh, uh, he said, right when you get there, no one will be guarding you because the big guys will go back to the guys they're guarding. And because you come around here, the guy who was guarding you will have gotten lost and picked out by all the, all the trees is my... One of my coaches would call them under there. And so he said, all you need to do is, is turn and take this little hook shot like this, put a little spin on it and put it right there on the backboard. And so we worked on it, worked on it, worked on it. Uh, there one Saturday in the gym and I was 
crying and my chin was quivering because I couldn't get it. And, and my dad recognized that. So we just went off and, and went away. And then the very next Friday, we're at Watkins Glen High School, not Watkins Glen, Watkins Memorial High School in, 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 on the east side of Columbus. And that very situation happens. I go in there, the trees are there. I'm like, I keep my dribble and I turn around, boom, and it goes in. Man, that was exciting. That was exciting. I got the, just, I'd never done it before in a game. I'd never done any practice before in a game, but, but that's instruction. My dad made me wiser than my coaches. My coaches didn't know I was going to do that. Right. But, but that's, that's what God gives us in life. Not something as trivial as basketball. Right. Um, but he gives us that in life. And that's, that's exciting. Verse 100. I have more understanding than the elders. That is old people. Um, for I obey your precepts. I gain understanding from your precepts. Therefore, I hate every wrong path. Isn't that a great verse for us? Um, I hate it. Why do I hate every wrong path? Because God's precepts give me understanding. When I pay attention to God's precepts, those are his laws. I get understanding in life. So I hate the, the, the wrong paths because that's trouble and, and hardship over there. And so I love God's precepts uh, and hate wrong paths. Uh, and then last one, you know, that we sang, your word is a lamp to my feet. I'm not in a dark room because I have God's word. His word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path so I can see where I'm walking. So I don't stumble. And, you know, you ever stumble? I was... <laughs> First time ever that big sign went up outside there, our big Christchurch sign that goes over the Kids Are Kids sign. I'm putting that, that up on the Saturday before our first Sunday we're there, and I unwrap it. It's just come from the printer and all that, and I, I'm putting it on there, and I drape it over, and I'm, I'm putting the, uh, there, we've got like bungee cords there, and I'm putting it on there, and it's blowing like crazy. And the, the uh, <laughs> so I don't have any of the bungee cords on. I'm trying to put the first one on, and the one side comes over, like that and it knocks me on the head and I, I fall flat on my side you know this is route 70 there are cars whizzing by and i'm like getting out from under the <laughs> under the banner there you know that that's embarrassing uh but <laughs> but jesus loves me so i don't care um but um you know it's 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 a uh, god's word is a lamp to our feet a light to our, our, our path so we're not stumbling you know, it's embarrassing when you stumble, when you're, when you're flat on the ground, when you trip. Sometimes when I'm real tired around my house, like really tired, I'll, I'll like, like not lift my foot up high enough and I'll kind of stumble. So I'm long there and I'm like, I hope no one heard that. You know? <laughs> um, but so God's word, that's the first thing. What gives us understanding in life? The Bible does. Not inside, not some magical voice in our head or even a voice from God. He doesn't speak like that anyway. Uh, you know, we're not, first of all, we're not a prophet, priest, or king in the Old Testament, but he's not speaking that way. He speaks to us through, through this, his word. But now, um, second thing, because as we, noted, as we noted last week, the Pharisees had God's word. The Jews who were rejecting God's word, they or rejecting Jesus, they had God's word, but they had no understanding. And that's what Jesus is pushing on these guys. And so what makes that, that difference? You know, religion professors, my professor, uh, Dr. Wolf, he, he read the Bible, but he didn't have understanding. Um, religion professors today read the Bible, they don't have understanding. Non-believers don't have understanding, but they know maybe they've read a verse or two. Why don't they have understanding? Well, it's this second, second thing. Number two, of course, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Here's how we gain understanding in life. The Bible tied up with the Holy Spirit, working together. Not the Bible without the Holy Spirit. That's the Pharisees. Not the Holy Spirit without the Bible. That's heresy. <laughs> right? You're going to believe all kinds of crazy stuff. You know, that's the undigested pieces of beef there. Um, <laughs> Uh, but the Holy Spirit enabling, that's your word there, the Holy Spirit enabling you to understand God's truth for human life, which is a, a word of synonyms for the Bible. Okay? The Holy Spirit enabling you to understand God's truth for human life, the Bible. 
And Jim read to us about this and how this works. And Paul explains this, that unbelievers and even unbelieving Jews who love the scriptures and say, we follow Moses and we love the law and all that kind of thing. They don't understand it and they haven't believed in Jesus. Why not? Paul explains this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, leading into verse 3. Here's what he says in 1 Corinthians 2.10. But God revealed this to us by his spirit. So that's the thing for humility for us as Christians. We didn't get the gospel because we were smart, um, because we were good, or because we were moral. We got the Spirit, Paul says. God revealed it to us. He's the one who makes the difference. He reveals it to us by his Spirit. And if we didn't have him giving us his Spirit, we wouldn't have gotten it. We wouldn't have understand, and we wouldn't have spiritual understanding in life to understand life and how it works. So God has revealed it to us by his spirit, verse 11 of, of 1 Corinthians 2. No one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Now, Paul's just said, you can't know, I can't know exactly what Bill's thinking right now. I can guess. He's probably thinking, boy, that guy is good looking who's talking right now up front. <laughs> Probably something like that. Yes, yeah, see, confirmation. <laughs> I have cousins who always kidded about being good, better looking than the other one. Four boys. None of them were good looking. Right? No. Um, uh, but, but he says, no one knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man within him. So you can guess what a man's thinking or a woman's thinking. But really, unless you somehow could connect with their spirit and, and, and see or hear their thoughts... Can you know what they're thinking? And then he transitions and says, and no one knows the thoughts of God, similarly, except the spirit of God. So if somehow we could have access, somehow we could have access to the spirit of God, then we could know what God is thinking and what his thoughts are. And so then Paul goes on in that line. He says, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God, uh, except the spirit of God. And then he says, verse 12, we have received the spirit who is from God. So it's like if, if, if Bill's spirit, his soul could, could come in me, right? Like, what was that Steve Martin movie? Uh, All of me? Yeah. <laughs> if Bill's soul could go in me. I'd say, oh, here's what Bill's thinking. You know, but, but the spirit of God indwells us as believers. And Paul calls us temples of the Holy Spirit in, in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and, and some other places as well. And so because God's Spirit is within us, we can know and understand the thoughts of God. And these are these thoughts here. These are the thoughts of God inspired by the Holy Spirit. You know, 2 Timothy 3, 15 and 16 and, and uh, 2 Peter uh, 1, 21. Um, the Spirit, we have received the Spirit who is from God, Paul writes, that we may understand, understand what God has freely given us. That's what Paul writes in, in 1 Corinthians 2. Let me read the whole uh, excerpt for you. But God has revealed it to us by his spirit. No one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. And we have received the spirit who is from God that we may understand what God has freely given us. So we get understanding in life as Christians because we have his word, but that's not enough. But we have his word and we have the spirit of God within us that enables us to understand all this wisdom, these commands, these truths, these attributes of God that we become um, as we become more godly and more Christ-like. Um, so number four, number four, uh, because Jesus gives you light or understanding, because Jesus gives you light, because he gives you understanding of life by the Holy Spirit who dwells within you, um, along with the Bible, okay, because Jesus is giving you this understanding by the Holy Spirit and by the Bible, uh, both along, along your side, A, rejoice at this. God could have left us stupid. God could have left us to flounder around in life, and, and we would have nothing to say but thank you because he had saved us. If God saved us eternally, but he didn't tell us how to live life. Still, how, how can we even repay that? We can never repay that. Eternal life, right? Whoever believes in the Son is eternal life, John 3, 16. 
Um, but in addition to that, it not only saves us eternally, but it gives us understanding in life. So rejoice at this. Realize the privilege you have, the privilege I have in life, the incredible advantage that we have in life. Because God has given us his word and his spirit. And by his design, he's, he's delighting for us to understand life when all our unbelieving friends and relatives don't understand lives or, or, or don't understand life. And we do. So rejoice at this. Recognize the great privilege that you have as a Christian that you can understand life and your friends are just left guessing. Sometimes they get it right. Most of the time they get it wrong. So rejoice at this. And second thing, be grateful. Be grateful. You know, as you walk in God's command, say, God, thanks for giving me direction on this. Thanks for showing, thanks for telling me to be humble instead of prideful. Thanks for telling me to be um, faithful instead of lustful. Um, thanks for telling me to be forgiving instead of vengeful. Um, all these things are paying dividends in my life. Thank you, God. I wouldn't have gone there naturally. Um, thank you. So be grateful that God gives you as a Christian understanding of life through his word and his spirit being in you. Um, so rejoice at this and be grateful to God that you can understand life. Um, so in other words, being ho-hum about this is just inappropriate. It just doesn't fit. You know, that you understand life by what God has given you. And you say, oh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> um, as you live longer and longer, you see more and more people along your side ruin their lives. Um, you know, I, I, yeah, I remember, you know, somebody wants a friend, a friend of mine and, and uh, she decided she's tired of her husband and went into an adulterous relationship with somebody else and uh, ruined, her, ruined her life, ruined her husband's life, uh, ruined her kids' lives. Um, and, and not irrecoverable. They're all still alive and going to school and getting jobs and that kind of thing. But um, that's hard. That's a hard situation. Um, so re rejoice that you can understand uh, life. Um, it's uh, having the scriptures and having the Bible is kind of like um, getting the, the someone coming and saying to you, I'll give you the, uh, the Powerball numbers uh, every time there's a Powerball drawing for the next four months. That would kind of be useful, right? Like before they happen, you have it. Um, like in what, not inside edition, what was that? Uh, new edition. What was that song with Kyle? What's his name on Saturday nights before Walker? Early edition. There was a TV show on CBS in the in the nineties called Early Edition, and the guy got at his doorstep at his apartment. It was Kyle, whatever, who plays on Friday night. Kyle Chandler plays on Friday Night Lights. Um, he would get tomorrow's paper today, and so he would use it to to go save people from stuff. Uh, but he had friends who would say, "Well, get the lottery numbers." <laughs> <laughs> you know, or if somebody came up to you and, and said, I will, I will give you tomorrow's stock page or tomorrow, you know, the, the closing prices of tomorrow's stock market every day, you'd need four days to become a billionaire, right? There's always some stock every day. If you don't know, there's always some stock going up at least 10%, right? Just put all your money in it every day for about four days. Um, you know, and, and this is what we have. We have this secret information. Um, Jesus said the secrets of the kingdom are not given to all, but I give them to you. Um, so rejoice, rejoice in this. Um, Solomon, wisest man who lived on the earth until Jesus, um, says in uh, Proverbs 3.13, Blessed is the man who finds wisdom, the man who gains understanding. For understanding and wisdom is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. She's more precious than ruby, rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand, and her left hand are, in her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant ways, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who embrace her. Those who lay hold of her will be blessed. And so he says in, a little bit later in Proverbs 4, 7, wisdom is supreme. And now Solomon is defined wisdom as uh, knowing the commands of God and doing them. That's how he defines wisdom in the book of Proverbs. 
uh, and you see that in the Psalms as well. So he says, wisdom is supreme, therefore get wisdom. Though it costs you all you have, get understanding. Uh, and so you hear this reflected in Jesus' words, right? You know, if, if you understand, if you get the gospel, sell everything, you know, and, and buy what you need to get the gospel. But Solomon says this about life and God's commands. You know, get, sell everything you have. It's more valuable. You know, what if you have all the gold in the world, but you're a fool? You'll lose all that gold in the world <laughs> really fast. James 1.22, Jim read for us, do not merely listen to the word, therefore, um, and so deceive yourselves, do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. So, so look at the words of this book. Look at these commands and don't walk away and forget what these commands are saying. It'd, it'd be on the level of you know, walking away from the mirror and saying, I forget, is my, is my hair red and curly? Um, it's not. Uh, <laughs> You know, James is saying that's a foolish thing. So he says, but the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom. That's the New Testament perspective on the law, on the commands of God. It gives freedom because now I know what to do and I'm not all confused. I think this is the right thing. I think this is the right thing. And then we do it and it blows up in our face. Uh, but, the, but the law gives us freedom because it gives us guidance on how to, how to handle ourselves. But we look intently into the perfect law that gives freedom, and we continue to do this, he says, not forgetting what we hear in the Bible, but doing it, we then are blessed in what we do. We're blessed in what we do. So B, application point from this, B. Don't leave your Bible on the shelf during the week. Don't leave your Bible on the shelf during the week. Read it. Read it. That's why we have all these Bible guides, you know, out, out there on the front page. You know, I put those together because I love you folks. That's why I put that together. Because um, I want you to be able to read the Bible and understand it, right? That's a lot of work. You know, it's years of work. That, that spiral guide there, yeah, it's years of work of reading the Bible through every year, every, you know, once all the way through every year. Uh, years of work, lots of seminary work. 105 hours of graduate credit to get my, to my MDiv, okay? Um, and, and because this is what saves you from ruining yourself, this information. And, and so as a pastor, I want you to know that information. I want you to know God's, God's word and to, be, and to be blessed in it. Uh, and, you know, so that's out there for free because I'm, it's not there for profit, right? Um, uh, and and anyone who wants it, you know, anywhere, I mail it to them or whatever, get it, get it to them, uh, because that's how valuable it is. But don't don't leave the Bible on the shelf during the week. Uh, read it, uh, really, really, really. Read God's read God's word. Even if you're reading a paragraph a day, you know, leave leave the Bible in your in the bathroom you most like you most often frequent. <laughs> you can read two sentences in there. Um, that's good. Um, so read, read the scriptures and, and don't just rely on what you get here and what you read here. That's great that you're here. Um, but don't just rely on that. Um, you know, and, and, and that can happen in, in, in churches. Sometimes people think, well, you know, sometimes in a more charismatic church, people will think, well, you know, they have a different view on scripture. So they just wait to hear what the God has spoken to their pastor you know, and that's practically the word of God for them. And so they don't read their Bibles. Um, but uh, in a, a service where, you know, if you think I know something about God, you might be tempted to say, well, I'll just wait till John explains it to me. Don't do that. Don't do that. Read your Bibles through the, through the week because God's word is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And it, it pierces your soul, the joints and, you know, up to the joints and marrows. And, and, it, and it convicts you and you're, your heart of what's good and, 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 and what's bad. And so read your, read your Bibles uh, at whatever pace. There's no, there's no set pace there. But love, love God's law. Uh, love his word. Grow in it. Grow in your understanding of it. Have as a goal for your life to master God's word. Now, you won't understand everything. I won't. Um, 
but you want that. You want it. That's why we're doing the Sunday school class that we're doing. Uh, I want you folks to understand what's Numbers about, what's Leviticus about, what's in the, what are in those books, and to gain some kind of mastery so you don't feel awash in the world like you're treading water in the middle of the ocean and you don't know where the nearest shore is. So with all the world that's putting in front of you and trying to teach you every day all its slogans, all its advertising, all the cliches that you hear, you need God's word. Here's what Jesus said about God's word. He said, quoting Deuteronomy 8.3, 8, Jesus says this, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So you need not only physical health, but you need the words that come from the mouth of God. You need to be fed and to be feeding yourself, eating God's word. Uh, I was encouraged by a, a, an old seminary classmate of mine um, who uh, once came here to Clayton and, and we're eating lunch with them. And he said, I know, uh, he said, I don't remember what I was preaching on. By the time it's Tuesday, I don't remember what I preached on Sunday. And he said, so I don't expect the people in the church to, uh, you know, remember exactly, you know, what I was, what I was saying. But I know this, he said, it's kind of like eating breakfast or eating lunch. You know, if you don't do, if you don't eat nutritious food, after a while, day after day, after a while, you get pretty sick. After a while, you're, you know, I had a teacher once who, you know, ate sugar cereals and he was like in his late fifties and lo and behold, his hip broke and he was in his fifties. You know, you, you need to nourish yourself to be healthy. And we nourish our souls with, with the word of God. Again, Jesus says, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So we need to be feeding our souls uh, with, this, with this word. So summary, summary for us. Jesus is the light of the world, the giver of light, the giver of understanding. Jesus is the light of the world. He is God, the creator of both physical and spiritual light. So he is God, the creator of both physical and spiritual light. And by giving you the Holy Spirit, by giving you the Holy Spirit, you have spiritual light. The light's on in the room of your life. And everywhere you walk in your life, every situation you come to, it's like God's light is above you, shining the room to be light so you can see what's there. So you can identify the parts. So you know which direction to go. And the more you know this, the more mastery you have of this, the more um, uh, accuracy you have. And where in, the, where in this room do I need to go right now? And in what timing? Um, you know, it's like uh, running backs in, in football. When they go up to a next level, you know, they're, they're going too slow and they don't have the timing of the game right now. But then all of a sudden, like for a running back, it'll, it'll click for them. And they talk about the game slows down. I remember this happened. Sorry, I'm an Ohio State fan. So Ezekiel Elliott, he was he was up, he was fighting for the starting job um, the year they won the national championship. Back and forth during, with Curtis Samuel, who is also in the NFL right now, playing for the uh, Commanders, and and it was just like neither was super great, and then all of a sudden it clicked for him, and then boom, he was that when the hole opened, he was there. Because he understood. He got the timing of it, just the, the, the flow of it. He understood how the blockers move and how the how the defense, you know, the tackles are moving and the defensive ends are moving and where you need to go just at what point. And that's what God's word does for us as believers. Um, we get more and more um, precision and, and timing and just how, how we do what and how we say what and the words we use and that kind of thing because we've become more familiar with this book with the aid of the Holy Spirit. So um, by giving you the Holy Spirit, you have spiritual light to understand the Bible. You have spiritual light to understand the Bible, which gives you understanding of life. And that's a great thing. Great thing to go through life and to understand it. Um, and, and lo and behold, you'll understand uh, life. And, and I was talking to one of you yesterday and you're like, and my kids are coming to me and asking for advice. You know, adult kids, because they, they get it. Um, you know, dad understands life. He gets it. So I don't, you know, I'm, uh, so they're coming to, and, and that's, a, that's a great blessing for us. Um, let's pray. Let's pray.